we get everyone seated, we'll begin our worship time together. Is, is Sean giving his presentation? Right away, yeah. If I can find him, where is he? Is Sean in the room? Oh, there you are. Goodness. I've been looking for you. <laughs> Welcome, and I'd like to welcome you all for being here today. Thank you for coming to worship with us. Uh, if you're a visitor or a member, if you can fill out a blue card and send it to the aisles we picked up in a few moments, we want to acknowledge that you've been here, and thank you for being here. Often I say it, but if you have questions about our worship together, please let us know what those questions are, and we should have a Bible answer for what we do, what we say, and how we conduct our worship here. Please turn off your cell phones or put them on silent or whatever. Uh, Claudia sends us note. It says, easy to be grateful when there are wonderful, wonderful people like you in the world. And again, that's from Claudia. Just a couple of notes. Um, there's a lost and found table out in the lobby. As you're going out the door, check out that uh, table. If anything looks like uh, it's yours or your child's, uh, please pick it up. There's three or four water bottles, there's clothes, there's hats and all kinds of stuff. So we're going to clean that out. If you don't pick it up this week, uh, next week, if you want it, just take what you want, I guess, right? Because we can get rid of it. Uh, speaking of lost and found, I have a, a, it looks like a child's ring. Uh, it's like a butterfly in half. If anybody's got a child that lost a ring, let me know. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so just, uh, just you know, I've had the privilege of working here with the youth for probably about the past um, seven, eight years. Um, and each year we try to do this big event. It's called CYC or Challenge Youth Conference. It's down in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Um, i just give you a quick update on it. Um, we had a group go down this uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, we had the pleasure, I think we had a total of, well, we had three people from North Warren go as well. So we had a total of 24 people uh, go down with us. We all got to go down there together. Um, CYC is a big, huge youth conference. It's the largest Church of Christ youth conference in the area. Um, it is all a cappella. Um, as you see, oh, I don't think that picture shows them, but um, in the middle of the whole group there, uh, there's a stage in the middle, and that's usually where the, the song leader uh, stands and the speakers as well. Um, and all the seats all around it. You're roughly looking at about 12 to 13,000 people uh, all there to worship God. I would say 85 to 90 percent of that is young people which is awesome. Um, if you've never, I mean, we get to worship God here, we get to praise God in song, we get to hear the wonderful melody of our voices as we praise him. And uh, that moment right there with 13,000 people is just amazing. Uh, all there for the same reason, all there to worship God and to praise in his holy name. Um, so we had the privilege of going this a couple weeks ago, and uh, we had an opportunity to go down there and uh, just enjoy fellowship with each other, enjoy the time with each other, um, and to listen to some great lessons. They have several speakers, uh, Lonnie Jones, TJ Kirk, uh, Brad Monahue, Dan Chambers, we'll just name a few. Uh, they give several, uh, several lessons throughout the weekend um, that our young people can hear and just hear about God just a, a few moments. And this weekend we went, just happened to be the 25th year anniversary, so it was, uh, the theme name was family. Talking about our Christian family, how we're all such a big family. And it's amazing from people who come all around the world to come to this event. And there for one reason, why? Because we're all a family. Um, we, I think they said the furthest people who came, we had a, a couple of people come from Peru that actually joined us that weekend. So it was an awesome, an awesome event. Um, it's an awesome time to uh, worship God, to praise him in song, and just to enjoy the fellowship with each other and fellow, fellow Christians all around the time. Uh, this is kind of our, our group picture we try to get each year. Um, just note there's two people missing, Shree and Diamond were not there in that picture. Um, but all the rest of us were. So uh, we had several, several uh, visitors who came with us. Um, uh, Alyssa brought two of her friends. Uh, Mandy brought uh, two of, uh, one of her friends and then her daughter. And then some other people came. And, yes, we had to support Michigan. You know, you know go blue. <laughs> so that was our flag to, to know where everybody was. So we know where our group was at all time. And I can tell you we were the only one with that flag. So we are all good. <laughs> But uh, we had a great time. I, I've been taking my kids since uh, Alyssa's 14 now. I've been taking her since she was in diapers. So um, it's mostly towards preteens and teens, but you, know, you can still get something out of it each year. Um, me as an adult, uh, and several of the other adults can attest to it, that you get a lot of as an adult as well, uh, the spiritual part of it. 
is amazing. Plus, they have a, a different area outside the main area here that has several of the Christian colleges, Freed Hardeman, Harding, uh, uh, Heritage, several of them to come there with their booths, whatever, getting the kids enticed about Christian colleges, and then there's Christian camps, and then several people like Apologetics Press and so on and so forth. A lot of good material for the kids and for the adults as well to learn and to get a little more information. Um, to say, it, for me, it was an amazing weekend, and several of the kids thought the same thing. They thought it was a great weekend, uplifting and spiritual, very, uh, very good weekend for everybody. Um, I think we had minimal issues throughout the weekend, um, but other than that, it was a great weekend. We had a huge cabin. We got to stand. We all got to fellowship. We had a couple devotionals there at the cabin. We had uh, Sunday morning worship there on, on Sunday morning, and then we headed out back this way. Um, it was an amazing weekend. Uh, so just so you know, uh, we try to plan this for every year. Uh, they've already put the date out for next year. It is February 21st to 23rd, 23rd uh, 2025. Um, they don't have a theme yet, um, but I'm sure it's, once again it's going to be an amazing weekend. Uh, we plan on getting things out there. If you have any questions or any uh, concerns or you know, it, need some more information about it, please you know, feel free to find me and, you know, either here or contact me at home, wherever, um, and I'll be more than happy to keep a hold of it. Keep uh, keep you guys all informed. Uh, it is a great weekend. Uh, adults are welcome to come as well. Um, you're more than welcome. Um, elders and uh, their wives are free, just so you're aware. <laughs> um, just a couple other, other activities. Uh, this morning we had our family youth uh, breakfast. Uh, we usually try to have it once a month. Uh, we had 19 kids this morning. Um, it's just a free breakfast. Time to fellowship and kids to come down and enjoy. Parents used to come down. Some of our elders come down, deacons, you know, whoever. whoever it's open to everybody. Um, we're trying to get our kids just to have a uh, nice, you know, quick meal before, before they start. And you usually have pancakes and sausage and all sorts of goodies. Um, next up, coming up this month, uh, we have uh, a movie night coming up this Friday. It's at the home of uh, Shane and Lily Wang. Uh, they've opened their doors for us. Uh, we're going to have a little family movie night there um, from 6 to 9. And then uh, after that, on, the, on March 29th, we'll have a family game night uh, here at the church building. Uh, it is going to be board games and card games, nothing electronic, so... It's pretty simple, uh, but it should be fun. But we're inviting the families out to come out too. You know, come out and help us to enjoy this time and fellowship with the kids. Um, usually, all information is going to be put up on our youth board. If you haven't seen that, you walk down this hallway. It's on the board here, and you got all information on there. I try to keep that updated with events coming up and uh, just uh, pictures and stuff like that. I got to update our picture board. But if you look in the little boxes in there, we have plenty of pictures in there for you guys to look at as well. Uh, just giving you, give, just give me some of the fun things and activities the kids have done. So we've had an awesome time so far. Uh, we want to continue to go through this weekend, this week, or this year, sorry, um, continue to promoting God with our children and keeping them close to them and, and just uh, help keep them faithful, keep them on their walk. So thank you. And thank you, Sean, for the update and for your work with our young people. Keep it going. <clears throat> Let's stand together and praise our God in song this morning. <clears throat> Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship this soul. Yeah. 
from Psalm 13. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. <clears throat> Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered ground, makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, cries each tear, holds my hand when I can stand on my own. Faithful love.
Today's daylight savings time, so we're like an hour early, and I have prayer. So the thought did occur to me that I could talk for like half an hour before the prayer, <laughs> and we would still be half an hour early, but then I thought Don and Ron and Peter might not like that, so anyway, I thought better of it. But uh, very quickly, uh, I thought recently of an article that I read many years ago, and uh, it was talking about how in a lot of situations of life, we don't really quite know what to do, and it gave a technique that I thought was very uh, insightful as to how to help with that, and they said, I wish I had thought of this myself, but uh, they said what we should do if we have doubts about uh, what we should do in a situation is pretend that one of our friends that we cared about came to us and explained that exact situation that we were in to us and asked for their advice, asked for our advice. And then being kind of a step away, we could tell them prayerfully and carefully what, uh, what we thought they should do and that would give us, by stepping back from the situation a little bit, that would, that would actually help us decide what to do, what somebody else should do that we cared about, giving our best advice. And I th I've tried it a couple of times, and I think it provides a little bit of distance from the situation, and, does, and it does allow us to come up with... Uh, solutions that we otherwise might not have come up with. Now the solutions I think sometimes we don't like because I think some of the times we don't uh, figure out what we should do in our own situations because the real, the real solution might be difficult. It might re require a difficult discussion with somebody that we don't want to do. It might require something of us that we don't want to give. But by stepping back and giving our best advice to someone else, sometimes it does clarify things. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for, uh, we thank you for your wisdom that you give us in, in life. Your word tells us that we, if we ask you for wisdom, you will give it to us. By reading your word and studying your word over time, we gain knowledge and understanding. By you being with us and having your spirit within us, you give us wisdom and understanding in that way that we can use. And we have friends and, and, and your word that uh, give us ways of coping with life. And we thank you very much for your presence in our life in those ways. We pray that you bless this congregation, uh, that we will be able to reach out into the community that we live in and share the knowledge of Christ and the knowledge of salvation with, with others. We love you and we pray that you will help us to more clearly understand your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Today, uh, this time, we're going to worship. We, we come to the, the part of giving. I was sitting here thinking about, sometimes you study for this stuff, and then your mind just starts going off all over the place. <laughs> uh, God knows what's on our heart. He knows we have a lot of things in our life, distractions. We have families, friends. We have things, possessions. We have money. He knows these things are near and dear to our heart. But God wants a place there too, and he wants to be at the front. God established this command for us to give, not because... He needs our money or, or the church needs our money. It, it's simply so that he knows we, he has a place. He knows that for us to give something is, is a sacrifice to him. As I read from 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We should not be compelled or feel like we have to give and grudgingly. You know, you see the the movie where somebody's holding the other side of the money or the check and it's, don't want to let go of it. Uh, that, that's what Paul is writing here. God wants us to freely give and, and, and give as much as we can, as much as we, we can in our heart uh, to show that maybe it hurts a little. Maybe, you know, this is, this is for God. This is what God wants. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, help us to, to put you first in our lives and in and, and our minds, our thoughts, uh, the things that are near and dear to us, uh, our time and our possessions, our money, uh, that we show you uh, that you are first in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. in the back and also in the front lobby if you'd like to give and also in your bulletin there is ways that you could give online thank you from second peter <clears throat> excuse me from second peter for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our lord jesus christ in power but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. <clears throat>
remember all that Christ has done for us and give thanks for his sacrifice because, because, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's in Romans chapter 5, 6, and 8. Let's pray. Lord God, we are sinners, but we are so thankful that Christ provided a way for us to live eternally with you by his atoning sacrifice. And so we give thanks for this bread, the body of Christ, that reminds us of how gracious you are. And I want to read also from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And to continue in uh, Romans. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for this cup, the blood of Christ. You have shown your love for us while we were still sinners. And we are eternally grateful that you have reconciled us and saved us by the death of Christ, but also by the life of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
This morning's scripture reading is from John 17, verses 15 through 19. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth, and you sent me into the world. I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. And now at this time, please give your attention to Peter Morphy. Well, I don't know what it means that we've advanced our clocks by one hour, except that I'm ready for lunch. <laughs> so, but we're glad that you're here. We're starting a new series called Current Events. Current events could be uh, described as things that are going on in society, things that are happening at this time, discussions that people are having, happening. Sometimes it's things on the news or things that uh, are just springing up and people want to discuss, and we're just aware of how things are going in the life and world, and maybe it's even just more specifically about our lives, how we're coping or how we're meeting certain needs and challenges that we have. But current events not only have to do with things that are happening in the world, but the events, the current part, 
I know, play on words. Who knew that somebody could actually play on words? But current means right now, but current also has to do with, you know, when you have a current in the stream. So this is a picture down by Niagara. These are called the rapids. I don't know if you've, if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, everybody goes to the falls, but then you go down about another mile, then there's these rapids that are very dangerous. If you ever got in them, you probably wouldn't get out because not only can you not swim in them, but they also pull you under. So it's not a good idea to swim right there. But that's the current. So what do currents do? Well, currents are able to drag us along, sometimes take us to places that we don't really want to go, or sometimes a current can be very gentle, and we are just, again, in that fishing boat, and we think everything's going well, and after an hour or two, we look around, and we have no idea where we are because we've been drifting. And this is the way the currents work. The events of our time have ways of changing us, and most of us that maybe are older than 10 years old realize that Things are a lot different than they used to be just a short while ago. And the, many of us that are older, we could say, and I don't know, maybe the young people don't like hearing that, but you know, 50 years ago when I was a kid, it's like, wow, you know, we didn't even know that time went that far back. You know, it's like, so, but you know, things are changing. Life is changing. So we want to talk about things that are happening in society and how they can easily change us if we're not careful. And they do have a way of changing the way we think, changing the way we feel, the decisions we make, and even what we consider to be truth. And so that's where I want in this series to start by talking about truth. Because if we don't talk about truth, it's really not much good to talk about anything that would mean anything. Because there, if there is, is no truth, if truth is just something that I feel or something that I think, and my truth can be different than your truth, and there's no such thing as absolute truth, then we just kind of all go based on really what we feel. What we feel is right. What we feel is normal. What we feel is factual. Can we even say that? But at least it's factual to me. And so that's the important thing. So the idea is testing truth. How do we test truth? How do we test it? How, how do we know what truth really is? Is it based on what someone says? Is it based on an idea? Is it based on something just because somebody has said it over and over and over and over again that we actually get to the point of believing it? Now, we know that today that's the way marketing works. The more I can tell you that I've got the best pizza in town, and if I tell you enough and I get enough other people saying the exact same thing, then you're actually going to believe it, whether it is or not. And as a matter of fact, when you order the pizza and you eat it, one of two things can happen. You're expecting it to be the best pizza in town. You taste it and go, well, my expectations were so high, this did not deliver. Well, because the delivery man actually delivered an hour late. But the other problem is that I've been told, it's, and even though it tastes like the cardboard box it came in, it's the best pizza in town because I've been programmed. Sometimes we used to use the word brainwashed. That I've, I've actually been able to train my mind to say this is the best. So how do we test the truth? Even when it comes to what is the point of life? Or where have we come from? Or is there even a God? How would we even be able to know these things? And so we want to talk about that. We're not going to get all the answers today because we only have a few minutes left before noon. But we may go a little bit after noon. So just keep that in mind. In, in Judges, this is interesting, it's 3,000 years ago, this was written. And you could imagine this is something you could read today on your news feed. In those days, there was no king in Israel. There was no leader. There was, there was no one really telling the people and showing the people. And there, was, there was no one at all that had an influence on people. And by the way, the people back then knew what was right. They had the law of God. They'd just been instructed in it through Moses and Joshua. Those were just their predecessors. So they're right there in the middle of knowing the law. But guess what? There was nowhere, no one there really to enforce it and to teach it and to, to encourage people to do it. And so what do people do? Well, they did what was right in their own eyes. And, and that seems to be the way it is in society today, right? That people, well, I just want to do what's right because I think it was right. I thought it was a good idea. I thought that would make me feel good. I thought it would be an answer to something. I didn't realize it would ca cause trouble. I didn't realize it would bother you. I didn't realize it was breaking the law. I'm just going to do what I think and what I believe is right. And that's the way a lot of people function today. As long as it's right for me, it doesn't really matter about you. And it doesn't really matter whether it's even right or not. As long as it's right for me, it must be okay. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. 
In Proverbs chapter 14, in verse 12, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man. It seems right. It seems true. It seems like this is really going to give me life. This is going to make me happy. This is going to make sense. But the way is the end of death. It seems so right, though. You don't understand. It just, everything seemed to come together. And I really felt, I really felt it was the best thing to do. And yet, the outcome is not what I expected. And why is that? Because the way I feel is not always the truth. What I think is not always the correct way. So I have to realize that I have to find out what the truth is. And the truth is beyond me. It's outside of me. I cannot just make it up as I go along. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. I know, okay, I know I've just offended like most people, right? See, I'm saying this is right in my own eyes. And the Bible saying, well... Hate to say it, but you're a fool. Right? Well, well that's a little offensive. That, that can hurt my feelings. You're not supposed to do that. That's not the way we operate today. You're supposed to be really nice to everybody, even if it's the truth. If the truth's going to hurt, don't say it. But this is what God said, so I'm quoting him. Got a problem? Talk with him. The way of fools right in his own eyes, but the wise man listens to advice. And, and this is... Again, these are thousands of years old. It's not like this was just written to try to correct some problem we're having today. The problem we're having today has always been a problem. We've kind of created it differently, masked it differently, and termed it differently, but it's always been the same, that I just want to live the way I want to live. I, and you know what the last thing I want? Somebody telling me what to do. Right? I'm just going to live the way I want. And so we've developed a society now where this is the main theme that there is no right there's no wrong it's just what you feel in John chapter 18 Jesus was being tried for his life he was on trial he had charges brought up against him that were false and even Pilate knew they were false Herod knew they were false and so here we have Jesus before Herod. And Jesus has a conversation with him, and Herod's trying to figure out what's going on. And all that happens, Jesus says to Herod, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. That's why Jesus came, to show the truth, to teach the truth, to live the truth. So we could know the truth, and we could follow the truth, we could live in truth. This is why Jesus came. So he came for truth. Everyone who is the, on the voice of truth listens to my voice. This is a good question now. So Pilate said, well, what is truth? I mean, what are you talking about? What is truth? How would I even know what truth is? Jesus says, I am truth. And I've come to bring truth. And Pilate says, well, I'm kind of confused. Even back then, they're like, what is truth? What is the source of truth? How can I even know it's true? So there's a picture of a stop sign. I don't know what you think of a stop sign. But, you know, we can start with some things that might be true for some people, but not necessarily true for everybody. And I would say it's red. And you may say, well, it doesn't look red to me. It looks more, I like, personally, I like green. I like the color. I think that's green. It's green. I could say that, couldn't I? And I could, you know what I say? I say this. It may be red to you, but it's green to me. You may see red, I see green. Because... I think I have the right to see it how I want it. Who are you to tell me it's red? I, I, I'm just saying it's green. You say, no, it's red. Really, it is red. And, and, and they may say, are you verde phobic? Are you against green? Are you, you have some kind of phobia against green because you call it red? No, I'm calling it red because I think it is red. Do you think it's red? Or do we know it's red? So it's not based on an opinion. Now, you may be colorblind, and when you see it, you don't see red, and that's understandable. But just because you're colorblind, does that make it a different color? Does that change the truth? Okay, so it's not a circle, it's not a square, it's not a triangle, it's an octagon. 
Well, I don't think it's an octagon. I think it's a square with rounded corners. And somebody else says, no, it's not. It's a circle with little pointy corners. No, it's not that either. It's not a circle. It's not a square. It's not a triangle. It's an octagon, right? I mean, is that true or not true? And if someone says, but I want it to be something else, does that change the, the shape of it? Okay, one last thing, and maybe a little bit more important, is what does it say? Not only what does it say, what does it mean? So I think we'd all agree it says stop, but what does stop mean? What does stop mean? So you get pulled over by a police officer, and he says, well, you did not stop at the stop sign. You went right through the intersection. And you could say many things to him. It probably would not be in your favor. But you could say, well, Mr. Officer, to you, that's a stop sign. But to me, it doesn't mean stop. See, stop means something else. For instance, I grew up in a home, and my dad, whenever he came to one of these things, he just kept on going. He never came to a stop. So I am now interpreting that stop does not mean cease. It means slow. So I slowed down and went through. What's the problem? Mm, it's not the definition of stop. Well, you don't understand. When I was a child, I was told often, but I was really hyper. My parents told me, uh, you need to stop doing that. And, and I, I just kept doing it. And they say, if you don't stop doing that, you're going to be in a timeout. And I kept doing it, never got a timeout. And if you don't stop doing that, you're not going to get ice cream. I didn't stop doing it, and I still got ice cream. So what does stop mean? Nothing. It doesn't mean stop. It doesn't mean anything. It's a different context. And so you say to the officer, that sign right there, I've never in my life stopped at one of them. And the officer would say, I understand. And you say, you see, you may think it says stop, and you may have a definition of stop, and that's your definition. It's just not my definition. So he says, okay, we'll go your way. Right? Is that, you think it happened like that? Probably not. You'd be in a little more trouble than saying, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I was in a hurry, and I didn't care, or whatever. And, you know, it's not, it's not going to work. Because this has a universal, no matter what country you go to, they have these signs. They don't always say the same thing, but generally they're, they're the same shape and the same color. You're supposed to stop. No excuses. And you can say, well, it may mean one thing to you, it means another thing to me. You see, the thing is, Mr. Officer, your truth is not my truth. Your definition is not my definition. And sometimes it can be challenging. Because we don't even know how this word, just looking at it, how it's spelled, right? Because the third letter we call it could also be a number, right? Does that not look like a zero to you? S-T-0-P. So it's stazirup. That's what this sign says. That's how I pronounce it. Stazirup. Oh, I'm pretty close, okay? Does it matter? Okay, one more illustration. This is, this, is, this, is, this is difficult sometimes. Somebody writes their email out on a piece of paper with a pen. Does anybody know how to do that anymore? The pen, the pen thing. Now, if they're in their email, they've got a, a letter, a number, or a stick that goes up and down. Now, you need to type in the email because you're going to send them a letter, a note. So, is it a number one? Is it a capital I, or is it a lowercase l? Or is it one of those vertical lines? Instead of having a slash, it's a vertical. So it could be a, a variety of things, right? Does that make sense? Let me ask you a question. Does it matter? Go ahead. Type it in, and type in. It's just one letter out of everything in that email address. You just put in the wrong one. You put in a capital I instead of a smaller case L, or a number one. You, you got the wrong thing. Does it matter? Just a little bit. Because if you don't get it right, it's not going to the person you think it's going to. See, it matters. Truth matters. It's not just, well, I felt it was a capital L, right? It matters. 
And this is the way life is. Life actually matters if it's going to work. There's got to be truth. There's got to be proper definitions that we can all agree on. Not about everything. We all have an opinion on some things, and opinions are okay too. But there are things called absolute truth. So we're going to go through this fairly quickly about seeing who Jesus is and why he came. This is John chapter 1, and John speaks a lot about truth, and he's here talking about Jesus. So he starts off, some of the other gospel writers talk about the birth of Jesus or the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. John starts with an introduction of who Jesus is and even before he was born. All the way back to the very beginning, not the beginning of Jesus because Jesus has always been, but at the beginning of time. In the beginning, that's the beginning of time when God started creating the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So this is Jesus. He is the word. So we think of a word like that's how we talk. That th those are... Uh, Ways that we communicate by using words that become sentences, that become paragraphs, that become lectures, that sometimes have too many words. But those are words that people use. But, but Jesus is the word. He, 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 is who, he, he is who Jesus is, not just really by listening to what he says, but seeing how he lives. Jesus is the word. He's from God. He's always been. He came into this world so that we may know about the truth. And so we may know about life. In verse 14, the word became flesh. So this word in John, beginning of the, the letter of John, in verse 14, it's that word that's described in the first few verses, became flesh. That's Jesus. He dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, glories of the one and only of the, from the Father. He's full of grace and truth, a great combination if you're all truth, you can be too overbearing. If you're all grace, you can be too uh, liberal or lackadaisical or non-helpful because you never really tell people the truth. You just kind of, well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So there's grace and there's truth. Both are necessary to function in life, at work in the family, in the neighborhood, even in church, grace and truth. But Jesus is full of truth. He's full of grace, but full of truth. So he's come from God. He created the world. He created everything in it. He created all the truth, basically, of things that we can agree on. Like, we probably all agree that there is something in the air. Now, you may not even say it's oxygen. I'll give you that. But there's something in the air that I have to breathe in and breathe out in order to live. Now, if somebody's not sure about that, then we could tape their mouth and their nose closed and see how it goes, right? After a while, they'll say, look, they won't be able to talk because they're all closed up. But they'll, mm -mm, I, I believe you. That's what they're trying to say, because I want to live. So there's a lot of truth. There's truth of gravity, right? So if you're you know, up on a high ledge and you jump down, it's going to hurt. So that's a truth that we all understand, we all believe in. You can say, well, I don't, I'm not even sure if I believe that. Well, you don't have to believe it if you don't want to, but it's not going to change because you don't believe it. It's not going to cease to exist. Gravity doesn't stop existing just because you decided you don't believe in it. That, that's what truth is. And yet today we're kind of like, we don't think anything's true. It's just all based on what we think and what we feel. But Jesus came so he can show us both what Grace and truth is and how they work together. John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. You can know truth. And how you know truth is by following Christ, not only by listening to what he says and watching what he does, but then you're starting to believe it, trust it, and live it yourself. And the more you live it, the more you see how it works and say, this is true because of what God has said, but it's, it's working just the way God said it was going to work. It's going to turn out the way God said it was going to turn out. So we will know the truth, and through that we'll be free. And this is what people are looking for. People in the world, everybody's looking for freedom. People think, I can find freedom by denying truth and just living the way I want. Jesus says, no, that's not where freedom's found. 
Freedom is found in finding what reality is and what's true, what's lasting, even what's eternal. And then you can find life. Then you can find joy. And then you can find peace. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you'd known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you've seen him. Jesus, I am very, very careful to watch what he says. I am the truth. He didn't say I'm a truth. There's many truths out there. I am the truth. So the things that Jesus says are going to last. I mean, even there's science. You can study science. and You can find truths in the world about science. But you want to know something? They're not even going to last. Because one day this world is going to be ended. I mean, technically, even if you're an evolutionist, you've got to believe one day this world's going to end. I mean, the sun's not going to burn for infinity. It's going to burn out. Can't last forever. So it's going to end. But Jesus' words will never end. What he said is eternal truth. So we're trying to find out the truth that really matters. And we don't want to compromise on that. We don't, we, we don't want to say, well, you know, people out there don't believe in truth, so how can we ever teach the truth? We've got to maybe sometimes reason with people or, or try to show people that truth does exist in the world that they live. And yet true, true reality is found in Christ. In Psalm 43, uh, verse 3, Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. This is a prayer, also another prayer in Psalm 148. The Lord is near to all who call on him, who call on him in truth. So it's important to know truth. How can we call on God unless we know who he is? Unless we know that he hears, unless we know that he cares, unless we know what his will is, how can we even pray? We're supposed to pray according to God's will. So there's things that we do need to learn and grow in. And certainly it's a process for all of us. We're all maybe on different places on this journey of getting to know God and getting to know truth and getting to know his will and how we ought to live. But these are prayers that we can pray to say, God, I want to know truth. I want to know what's, what's real. The things that I can really put my faith and my confidence and invest my life in these things that I can be who God's called me to, to be. So this is the verse that was read a little bit earlier in John 17. And this is the prayer that Jesus prayed. And again, this speaks a lot about truth. I do not ask that you take these, he's talking about the apostles, the people that had been with him, that he had trained. Don't take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in the truth. Sanctified means changed. It means set apart. It means made holy, made acceptable to God, made pure. Sanctified, we could maybe also say, means going back to the original plan and the original pattern that God had for mankind. For human beings. And if you want to know more about that, you only have a few verses to read when they were in the Garden of Eden. A place called paradise. A relationship with God. On a daily basis, they walked with God in paradise. That's the original plan. And guess what got in the way? Somebody who came and lied. Deceived. Told Eve, no, what God said is not true. When you eat this, you'll become like God and you'll know all things. And she didn't believe God when he said, the day you eat of it, you will die. God told the truth. She listened to the lie. And here we are today, right? <laughs> still going today. It's nothing new. People still want to live the way they want to live. And they do it by denying truth and denying God and denying that there's anything that's universal that can be applied to my life, and I'm going to live in my little cosmic bu bubble and live the way I want and say, you know, just don't hurt my feelings. Don't speak out against me. Don't be a hater. Don't be a phobic. I mean, think about all these words that can go in front of the word phobic, right? 
I mean, as soon as you disagree with somebody, all of a sudden you're phobic. It's like, I'm not phobic, I'm just telling the truth, right? So maybe I'm a, a you know, a lie phobic. I'm not really afraid of lies, I guess, so I'm not even phobia. But, you know, I, I don't want to live in that way. I don't want to live in a lie my whole life. I've done enough of that in the past. I want to live in the truth. I want to know what's real. And so that's what Jesus is calling the people to, a much different way of living. And so for us to really know what God would have us to do, we first of all have to believe there's some truth out there to be known. It's not just how you feel. And I think, just even trying to think rationally, logically, it only makes sense there's got to be something that's true. There's got to be something that we can all agree on. This, this is true. It's true all the time. It's true in every generation. It's true in every society. It's true in every state in America. Some things are just true for everybody. It's just something that we cannot deny. And there's plenty of things if we came up with a list. But then the things that we really don't want anybody telling us is truth, especially is the way we ought to live. Or things like morality. And so we think we can just get away with doing what we want. And quite often, if you really think about it, most people... Even in America, where we have so much knowledge, we have so much availability to learning, most people are living a lie. You think about it, a lot of people are living a lie when it comes to science. A lot of people are living a lie when it comes to politics. A lot of people are living a lie when it comes to religion. A lot of people are living a lie when it comes to what real love is. It's a lie from the world. Quite often you can tell it's a lie because it just doesn't work. But you can also know it's a lie when you're encountering it by saying, what does God say? And when he says something completely different than what the world says, you've got a choice to make. You can believe the truth or you can believe a lie. Jesus came that we would know truth, we would have life. If we can encourage you in your walk with the Lord... If we can pray with you, if today you want to make a decision, say, I want to know the truth, I want to grow in truth, I want to commit my life to the truth, and I want to know more about Jesus. We can sit down and study the Bible with you, if you'd like. We can answer some questions you may have. We can talk back and forth and try to, to work things out about what the real truth is. Or if today you're ready to make a decision to follow Christ, and if you want to be baptized into Christ today, Put your old behind. Start a new walk in the truth. Let's stand. We'll sing the song. Let us know how we can be a blessing today. Oh, our, our
Please be seated. Thank you, Peter. It's, uh, it's amazing how things we thought were true before people are telling us are not. Um, luckily, we have the word that it's true forever. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, we know that many things that we think are right are, are not, are, are foolish. And please guide us and help us to do your will and to know what you want us to do and what is right. Thank you for your word that we can study that is the truth that never changes, Lord. And please guide us in your word, in your truth. Strengthen us that we can submit to the truth and do your will and live as you want us to. Help us to be faithful in prayer and leave everything to you and not be anxious, but to trust in you and your word and your truth and to live as you want us to. Lord, there are many who could not be with us today. Um, people have lost loved ones recently and people have long time illnesses that uh, may never get better and then the people have new things that are happening to them Lord so many please comfort them strengthen them and heal them if it's your will help us to support them as you would have us to help us as your church here at Royal Oak to love each other to submit to each other to strengthen each other and to be example in this world to be example of the truth that you've given us Lord Thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. One quick announcement that Sean already mentioned, but this Friday the Wangs are hosting for the youth and family uh, a Devo and movie night at 6 p.m., so remember that. And Ken will close us with one song. I couldn't help but think, as Sean was showing the, the pictures of, uh, of the goings on at CYC this year, that one shot from the back, all these people, and I couldn't help but think that one day all those people will be together in the presence of God. All Christians will be there to praise his name together, and I want to be part of that crowd. Let's stand together as we dismiss in song. <clears throat> sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy. missed.